Hello everyone. So today I am planning to revise whole A physics course. I will revise, explain each definition, each formula, and uh, each concept. So if you want to revise your whole course in one lecture, watch this video till the end. Okay. So let's start. Uh, the first chapter is about physical quantities and units. And uh, first of all, there are base quantities and units. So there are six base quantities included in your AS course. The quantities on which the all other quantities, uh, which are the bases of all other physical quantities are known as base quantities and unit of units of base quantities are called base units. So, uh, name of the base quantities with their unit and symbols are, are listed as length is base quantity whose unit is meter and symbol is m, small m, time unit is second, symbol s, mass, kilogram, kg, electric current, ampere, capital A, temperature, Kelvin, K, amount of substance, uh, mode. So these five are included in your A scores but this will be uh, checked in your A2. Okay, so you should know about all these five base quantities. And derived quantities are those which are derived from the base quantities. And, uh, and the, the example of derived quantity is speed. Speed is defined as distance uh, per unit time. So the, the unit is meter per second, this is symbol. And then acceleration is the rate of change of velocity change of velocity over time taken, unit is meter per second square, area length to breadth, unit meter square. Th these are the units in terms of SI base units, okay? So volume uh, unit is meter cube, density mass per unit volume, kg per meter cube force is mass time acceleration. And uh, the unit of force is Newton, and if we, uh, if we want to express this Newton in terms of SI base unit, we will use this formula. So that will be kg meter per second square. Frequency is uh, one over time period. The unit of frequency is hertz. And in terms of SI base unit, is it, it is one over second. Electric charge uh, is Q is I times T. So the unit of electric charge is Coulomb. And uh, Coulomb in terms of SI base unit is ampere second because time is base unit. Time, uh, sorry, current is base quantity and time is base quantity. So the charge Coulomb in terms of SI base units will be ampere second. Work or energy is F into D. And uh, the unit of these uh, is Joule. In Joule, in terms of SI base unit, will be will be derived from this formula. Uh, F is meter uh, kg meter per second square, and D is meter. So if you will put this uh, the unit of force, and D will get this thing. Power is work done per unit area. So the unit of power is watt, and uh, watt in terms of SI base unit will be. Uh, you will derive this from here. So. Uh, you will put unit of power, uh, unit of work that is uh, kg meter per second square divided by time. So you will get this unit. You can verify it. So potential difference is uh, uh, defined as work done per unit charge. So unit is volt and volt in terms of SI base unit is you will put unit of uh, work over here in this formula and you will divide with the unit of uh, charge that is in per second. So you will get this unit. Then comes uh, homogeneous, homogeneity of an equation. Uh, for an homogeneous equation, SI base units on both sides should be same. Okay. So if an equation is, uh, if an equation has more than one terms, then each term must have same SI base unit. For every correct equation, it must be homogeneous, but every homogeneous equation may not be correct. To find the power of any quantity in a given formula, insert SI base units on both sides and equate the powers to powers of the same basis to find some unknown. For example, if you are, uh, if you have to find, uh, for example, you are given this T is time period and uh, 
L is length power A over uh, G power B. And you will be given that, uh, you will uh, be provided the information about each quantity. This is time, this length A, L is length, and G is gravitational acceleration. And using homogeneity, you have to find the powers, the values of A and B. What you will do, you will put SI base unit on this side, and you will put SI base unit on this side. And you will simplify it at the end, you will equate the powers of same base quantity. For example, uh, uh, for example, if you have S1 uh, uh, times M square and other, other side we have S power A and M power B. So you will equate powers of S to get value of A, that is one and to get, you will equate power of M to get value of B, that is two. Okay, this is very important thing. So you you will all mostly you you face the question that uh, that is related to the homogeneity, and you have to find the unit of um, power of some variable. Okay, and using the homogeneity, you uh, you will check a given relationship whether it is valid for that given quantity or not. Then come prefixes. Uh, multiples and submultiples of 10 are known as prefixes, and these are included in the course. Terra is represented by capital T, and its value is 10 power 12. Then giga, G, value 10 power 9, mega, 10 power 6, kilo, 10 power 3, deci, 10 power minus 1, centi minus 2, milli, this, micro, 10 power minus 6. The symbols of these. Uh, Symbol of these prefixes are unique. Okay, so you must remember these symbols. For example, if you have to simplify five terahertz, so this tera is prefix and whose value is ten power twelve. So five times ten power twelve hertz. Okay, so if you have to simplify five micrometer divided by one nanometer. So what we will uh, you will do, you should know the value of this. So micro is 10 power minus 6 times uh, this is meter over nano is 10 power minus 9. So you will simplify this. That is 5 times 10 power minus 6 plus 9. Okay. So that is 5 times 10 power. Uh, you can you can simplify this. This is uh, minus six plus nine, that is six. So what you should know, you should know the value of each prefix and its symbol. Then uh, comes the scalar quantities and scalar quantities are those quantities which have only magnitude only. Okay, so if you are, uh, you are asked to define scalar quantity, we should write it as this quantities which have only magnitude. So example are length, speed, volume, density, area, electric current, electric charge, potential difference, energy, power, temperature, pressure, and mass. So vectors are those quantities which have both direction and magnitude. Okay. So examples are displacement, velocity, acceleration, momentum, force, weight, electric field strength, and so on. So how you will add vectors, addition of vector is not like the addition of scalar. So addition of vector is a process of finding a single vector which will give the same effect as all vectors have. Addition of vector is not like the addition of scalar. For example, five kg uh, plus two kg is seven kg, but five Newton plus two Newton, that may or may not be equal to seven Newton because it depends on the direction. If the forces are in the same direction, they will be, uh, the sum will be 7 Newton. If they are not at the, in the same direction, if, if they have some other direction, then the result will not be 7 Newton. So addition of vectors can be done by two ways, scale diagram and using resolution of vectors. So scale diagram, what is the procedure of finding the resultant of, two, resultant of vectors using scale diagram? You have to set a reasonable scale. Draw first vector using that scale, then you have to draw the second vector from the head of first vector, 
then draw the resultant vector from the tail of first vector to the head of last vector. Convert this length into given quantity using the same scale, measure the angle of the resultant vector given to vector. Oh, and you have two methods in scale diagram. If you are adding only, uh, for example, uh, two vectors, and uh, you have a triangle met method of vector addition. For example, this is one vector, this is another vector, and you have to you have to add them. So first you will draw first vector, then you will draw second vector from the head of the first vector, and this will be the resultant. Okay, from the tail of first vector to the head of the last vector. So in parallelogram method, what you will do, you will draw first vector, and you will draw second vector from this point. And you using the compass, you will draw a parallelogram from this point. You will draw an arc of length equal to this vector. And from this point, you will draw an arc of length equal to this vector. And these two intersect at this point, then you will join. This is the resultant. So you can observe that the resultant will be in the same direction. You will have same magnitude if you will add uh, either by using a triangle method or parallelogram method. Okay. So for addition of perpendicular vectors, you can use Pythagoras theorem. For example, if you have these two vectors and you have to add them, so you will draw this vector over here and this will be the resultant and the magnitude of this resultant vector will be obtained using this formula. And the direction of this, this vector, resultant vector will be obtained by using this trigonometric ratio that tan theta is equal to B, this is B and uh, sorry, this is A, and this is B, that is tan inverse of B over A over B. So, so for subtraction of vector to find A minus B, what, will, what you will do, you will use this A plus minus B. So you will find negative vector of this B, that is minus B, and then you will add in A. Then comes resolving a vector. Resolution of vector is a reverse process of addition of vector. Here we find components of a given vector. So in rectangular components, uh, these two components are uh, the two components of vector which are at right angle to each other, okay? So first set the reference direction, mostly it is given, then find the vector components parallel to and perpendicular to this direction. For example, if uh, you are given this vector and you have to find these uh, its rectangular components, so this component is uh, horizontal component and this is vertical component. And this component is uh, adjacent to this angle. So this is uh, obtained by using F cos theta because cos theta is this base over this hypotenuse. So F cos theta will be this component and F sine theta will be this component. So if uh, you will increase this angle, what will uh, be effect on these two components? Mostly it is asked in the exam. So the horizontal component will decrease. If you will increase this angle, what will be the effect on horizontal component? This will decrease and vertical component will increase. Please remember this is quick summary lesson. So mostly uh, I will revise the whole, the all facts. Okay. So that will be helpful for your exam. So on inclined plane, we will, uh, the reference direction is parallel to the plane. And in this way, we will resolve this way. Uh, we will find its components perpendicular to the plane of this horizontal plane and parallel to the plane. And this angle theta and the, this angle will be equal. If this is theta, theta is angle of the inclined plane with the horizontal surface, then you can verify that this angle is 90 degree and this is 90 minus theta in this right angle triangle. So this angle will always be theta degree. So this is component of this weight perpendicular to the plane. And uh, this is W cos theta as I have already told you and this is W sin theta. So the component of weight that is acting uh, in the downward direction parallel to the plane is W sin theta and that, that acts perpendicular to the plane is W cos theta. 
and the normal contact force will act in this direction okay and if there is uh, uh, for example right now there are three only these three forces uh, two forces sorry weight and normal contact force if there is friction then uh, that will also act on the object so then come addition of vectors using resolution of vectors resolution of vectors then uh, this is the process resolve vectors in the chosen reference direction for example horizontal and vertical direction find sum of horizontal components and then find sum of vertical components then use this formula fx square plus fy square and this because when you have obtained all the resultant of horizontal components and then the resultant of vertical components then this the resultant of these two components will be f and f will be obtained using this formula for angle of the resultant use this formula because this is the angle and you have to use tan of theta is equal to fy over fx this is how we will add two vectors using resolution of vectors then come second chapter that is about measurement technique so first of all we will deal how to use cro and cro is used to measure time period frequency and amplitude of waves okay cro has uh, two scaling that is one is time scaling and other is vertical scaling also known as y gain so a uh, time scaling gives us the scaling about x on x axis and y scaling gives us the scaling about uh, in the y axis for example how we will find time period time period will be time scaling times horizontal distance of one complete cycle i will explain with the help of this example and amplitude is y gain times vertical distance from the central line so frequency will be one over time period so for example uh, you are given an example in which you are given a, si a signal or for this signal time scaling is this 2 volt per dvn and y gain is 5 volt per dvn this is an example so first you will check that one cycle is completed in how many dvn so one cycle is completed in 4 dvn 4 cm so time period will be if 1 cm represents 2 milliseconds then the time period will be 2 times 4 that is 8 milliseconds and amplitude is uh, you have to count the centimeters on vertical scale so this this represents the amplitude so how many centimeters are there there are three dvns of three centimeters and uh, one centimeter or one dvn represents five volts so amplitude is uh, three times five fifteen volts okay so time scaling uh, now this is an again important thing that time scaling and horizontal distance of one cycle are inversely proportional to each other if you are not changing the time period of original signal and just you are changing the time scaling so if you will increase time scaling the horizontal distance of one cycle will decrease because in this case the num the value of one centimeter if you are increased the if you increase then the horizontal distance of one cycle will decrease that you can easily understand from here if this signal uh, if 2 millisecond represent 1 dvn then this signal is completed in 4 dvn if uh, if rather i should set that the 4 millisecond represent 1 dvn if i change the time scaling and if i increase it then this signal will be completed in 2 dvn okay so uh, i should draw the signal And there is no change in vertical uh, vertical scaling. So now this these two deviations are equal to eight millisecond because the time period we are not changing the time period of original signal. What we are changing we are changing the time scaling and vertical scaling. So in this way, how the signal will uh, will look that will change. Okay. So if the we are not changing the time period so time period is kept constant if we will increase time scaling this horizontal distance of one cycle will decrease and if we are not changing the amplitude and if we are increasing y gain 
the vertical distance of one uh, one complete signal will decrease. Okay, so they are in your superposition. Now comes random errors. So the errors whose magnitude is not constant, random error can be reduced by taking average of several reasons. Human reaction error and parallax error are easy. So they don't have constant magnitude. So uh, they will, if you will find the average, that average will be close to the true value. And example of random error are human reaction and parallax error. Systematic error, the reading is larger or smaller than the true reading by a constant amount. Causes are zero error, wrong calibration, faulty instrument. Systematic error cannot be minimized by taking the several readings and finding the average. This is very important. Because if there is a constant shift in the reading, if you will take average, that will average, average will have, will also have a constant shift. So by taking average of several values, it will not minimize the error, okay? So adjusting an A meter to remove zero error will reduce the systematic error. If zero error is the cause of systematic error, what will be the solution? You will, you will adjust that, that meter to uh, uh, for its zero error correction. You will use zero error correction so that will be the solution of the systematic error. So now we will see that what is the effect of errors on the graph. For example, if two variables x and y are related by this equation, y is p minus qx, this is an equation of straight line if you plot x on x axis, y on y axis. So a uh, scatter of points about the line is due to random error. And shift of y intercept from P will be due to systematic error because this line has y intercept is P and its gradient is Q minus Q. So it is a straight line with negative gradient. And the scatter of these points, for example, in this way, the measurements, the data is on both sides of this line. And this line has y intercept of p. So this has a random error, but no, no systematic error in this situation. Okay. So in the, in the second example, for example, if I have this, all, all readings lie on this straight line. So there is no random error, but each value is shifted from this y intercept p. Actually, this reading should have, actually, this should have crossed from this p and if if it is the case like this then there is no systematic error no random error but in this case in this particular example there is no random error because all points lie on the straight line and the line is shifted from original uh, from original path there is a constant shift in the line that is shifted in the downward direction so there is uh, there is a, this is because of the systematic error and there is no, no random error. Okay. Then comes precision and accuracy. Precision is determined by the range of values. If there is smaller range, the values are precise. If the greater range, the values are less precise. More range means less precise. Precision is affected by random error. Okay. So the random error will affect the precision of the data. More random error means uh, less precise. Accuracy, if the measured value is close to true value, then it is accurate. If you have more readings for a single measurement, then we compare mean of these values with the true value. If the difference between the mean and true value is small, then the, then the data is more accurate. Accuracy is affected by the systematic error. This is important. Now, precision and accuracy from the graph. For example, uh, a fixed quantity x naught is measured several times and the results are summarized. This on vertical axis, we have the number of times a particular value is measured. So uh, this x naught is the mean. Okay. So uh, over here, the fixed quantity x naught lies on the mean. Okay. 
and over here the fixed quantity have the distance from the mean and this distance if this distance is greater than the value the distance of this mean from the true value will tell us about the accuracy if this distance is more then it is less accurate and if distance is uh, small then this is more accurate in the range range of these values is determined by this distance you can see that in measurement b this range is more as compared to the measurement in a so a is more precise than b because a have this less range and the distance of this mean from the true value will determine the accuracy over here this is this 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 is the difference of the mean from the true value and over here the true value lies on the this mean there is no difference so uh, a is more precise than b and a is also more accurate than b okay then comes compound errors the error in a quantity which is obtained from addition subtraction multiplication division of many quantities the quantity which is obtained from addition subtraction multiplication division of other quantity is known as compound quantity and the error in that compound quantity is known as compound error so for example if over here z is compound quantity that is obtained from the addition of x and y and what is the rule to find the absolute error in z so over here absolute error in z will be the sum of absolute errors in x and y in second case where we are going to subtract two quantities z is the difference of x and y over here the absolute quantities in z is also obtained by the addition of absolute errors in x and y in case of multiplication like z is x into y absolute errors in z so the fractional error is z is equal to the sum of fractional error in x and y delta x over x is fractional error in x delta y over y is fractional error in y delta z over z is fractional error in z so if you multiply with 100 you will uh, on both side you will get percentage error in z that will be the sum of percentage error in x percentage error in y so in case of multiplication absolute error is added and percent uh, sorry fractional error is added and percentage error is also added in case of division of two quantities z is x over y fractional errors are added fractional error in x plus fractional error in y will give you fractional error in z and percentage errors will also be added so for example if you have a power formula z is a x power m y power n where a m n are constant a has no effect on percentage error and fractional error so if you multiply a quantity with a constant or divide it with a constant it will not change its fractional error or percentage error but it will change its absolute error so delta z over z will be this power m times delta x over x plus n times delta y over y or percentage error in z will be m times percentage error in x plus n times percentage error in y So, for example, if you have z is x squared times y cube, if x has three percent error, y has, for example, four percent error, then the percentage error in z will be two times percentage error in x plus three times percentage error in y. That is eighteen percent. Okay. So, in second chapter, you will uh, mostly this is about errors and compound errors. That is very important chapter. so then comes kinematics and uh, in kinematics kinematics is the study of motion of object without considering causes of motion so there are basic terminologies in kinematics first of all is distance distance length of path covered by an object it 
its unit is meter and it is a scalar quantity distance will always increase if the object is coming back to original point distance can never decrease and distance can never be negative okay so displacement is the shortest distance between two points or distance from a fixed point in a particular direction so if you have to define displacement this you will dis define displacement as distance from a fixed point in a particular direction it is a vector quantity so it can be negative as well if the displacement from a point a uh, from a point on the right side is taken as positive then it it is negative on the left side of a point for example if this is your point and o then if this displacement is positive for example this is positive 5 meter and if this object is at the left side of this point then this displacement will be negative for example ne negative 4 meter okay so if object remains on the left right side of this point and if object is coming towards this point o then the displacement will decrease and it is still positive it will decrease and become zero if the object is at the same point and it will become negative if the object is moving towards left direction and it is still negative but it will decrease in magnitude and it will become zero if the object reaches at the same point okay so this is an example if an object follows this path this is the distance and this is displacement speed is the rate of change of distance and that is d by t or average speed is total distance over total time unit is meter per second it is a scalar quantity so velocity is rate of change of displacement velocity is a vector quantity and unit is the same as speed velocity can change if the direction or magnitude or both are changing okay this is the same for all vector quantities to change a vector quantity you can change its magnitude its direction or you can change both if an object changes its direction to opposite direction then the sign of velocity will change if the object was moving towards left or right direction if the velocity is positive and if it it changes its direction towards left then the velocity will become negative okay if the object reaches to the same point then the total displacement will become zero and the average velocity of the object will become zero acceleration is the rate of change of velocity unit is meter per second square it is a vector quantity velocity is constant and acceleration is zero if velocity changes at constant rate then acceleration is constant for example if you have this acceleration 10 meter per second square then the velocity will will change by 10 meter per second in each second if there is no air resistance then the acceleration of free falling object is constant direction of acceleration is in the same as direction of net force this is this is done by using this formula then acceleration and velocity are in the same always in the same way. acceleration and net force sorry are always in the same way. but the velocity and acceleration can be different because the acceleration is always in the direction of net force but the velocity is in the direction of motion of object <coughs> excuse me deceleration if the magnitude of velocity is decreasing the subject is slowing down then it is known as deceleration constant deceleration is when this then decrease in velocity in each second is same then comes equation of motions this is first equation v is u plus ot s is u plus v over 2 into t s is u t plus half ot square Two s is v square minus u square, and one last is also important. S is v t minus half a t square. Okay, so these equations are only applicable when acceleration uh, when acceleration is constant. And over here, s is displacement, and uh, u is initial velocity, v is final velocity, as acceleration is t and so. all these equations are only valid for constant acceleration graphs gradient of distance time graph is speed gradient of displacement time graph velocity gradient of velocity time graph is acceleration area of velocity time graph is displacement area of speed time graph is distance for example over here you have velocity and time if it is a straight line then the gradient of this graph is constant so over here 
the gradient is acceleration, so acceleration is time. Over here, acceleration of this graph is increasing. Okay. If you draw a tangent, you will see the gradient is increasing. So, gradient of this graph is increasing in velocity time graph, gradient is acceleration, so acceleration is increasing. Over here, on vertical axis, you have displacement. On horizontal axis, you have time. So, gradient is decreasing. So, the velocity is decreasing. Okay, at time t0, the gradient is maximum. So, velocity is maximum. This is very important. At start, velocity of object is not zero. Okay, so this is very important that at t0, the velocity of this object is not zero and the velocity is maximum. And then the velocity decreases and at this point, velocity of this object becomes zero. Let's discuss this, uh, but the gradient of this graph, the gradient of tangent is throughout positive. The so sign of velocity is positive. This means that object is, uh, object is moving in the same direction. Let's do this question. Velocity time graph is given, and uh, acceleration at over here will be uh, gradient of tangent. Acceleration of acceleration at y is greater than the acceleration at z because the gradient at y is greater than the gradient at z. So at z, the velocity of object becomes constant. So acceleration at z is zero. This is velocity time graph in, of an oscillating body that is moving, uh, changing its direction at time t0 to point r, velocity is positive. Till this point, velocity is positive, object is moving in the same direction. After this, the velocity becomes negative, this means the object changes its direction. Okay. So at q, the gradient is zero. At this point, if you take gradient at q, over here, acceleration is zero for this time, for very short time. So at point R, the velocity is zero, but acceleration is not zero. It's very important. At this point, acceleration, the gradient is not zero, but the velocity is zero. So object comes to rest for very short time, but acceleration is not zero. So very important. So this is a uh, velocity time graph. And if we uh, want to draw its acceleration time graph, till this point, we can see that the gradient till this point increases. So acceleration should increase in magnitude. And the gradient is positive. After this, the gradient of this graph decreases. And it becomes zero at this point. So the acceleration decreases and becomes zero. Okay. But the gradient is positive throughout, so acceleration will be positive throughout. Now comes the graph of bouncing objects. If an object uh, hits the surface and bounces big, then, uh, for example, if uh, air resistance is negligible and object is falling under the gravity only, then the velocity time graph will look like this. If an object is dropped from some point over here, the velocity of it, this object will increase at constant rate. Okay. So this is the point at which the object will hit this surface. The velocity will maximum, it will have constant rate. After this, the object will start its motion in the upper direction. So the direction of velocity should change. That's why the velocity becomes negative and the magnitude of velocity decreases. Because as object moves up, it, it always slows down. Because the acceleration is in the downward direction, and the velocity is in the upward direction, it slows down, and it is at the top position. Over here, the ball is falling. Now the ball is raising, and this is at the top position after first impact. Then the velocity of object becomes positive, and it increases. In its magnitude, this is the second impact. And after this, after the second ob ob object moves up, velocity decreases, and then again, velocity increases. Okay, 
Why these parts are straight line? Because acceleration is constant. Under the, uh, under the gravity, if there is no air resistance, object falls only under gravity, then the acceleration will be constant. And so the velocity time graph should be a straight line because the gradient of velocity time graph is an acceleration. And if you have to draw the acceleration, then the acceleration will be the gradient of these parts and that is, that is the gradient is positive. So this is the acceleration. Acceleration is constant. We are ignoring the acceleration during this part. Okay. So that's why acceleration will be a straight line and acceleration is constant because the downward direction is taken as positive. Object is moving in the downward direction and the velocity is positive. So acceleration will be the gradient of this graph that is constant. Projectile motion is very important. Let's say an object is thrown from here with velocity v at an angle theta. Okay. So this velocity will have two components. One is horizontal component, that is v cos theta, that is vertical component, that is v sin theta. And this is the path of projectile, and uh, this is horizontal surface. This maximum horizontal displacement is known as range. Initial velocity v uh, has two components. Okay, horizontal component of velocity is v cos theta, and vertical component is uh, v cos theta will not change; it will stay because there is no air resistance. Vertical acceleration, there is a vertical acceleration due to gravity, which is constant in the downward direction, always in the downward direction. So uh, it is never zero, even at the top. This is very important. At this point, even acceleration is not zero, and acceleration is still constant. But the vertical component of velocity over here will, will be zero and horizontal component of velocity will be same here. Okay. And vertical component of velocity will decrease. After some time, it will be smaller than the original value because acceleration in the downward direction and it becomes zero at this point. After this, vertical component of velocity will be in the downward direction and it will increase. So, this is initial vertical, initial horizontal velocity. No, no, there is some mistake. This is, uh, there should be sine theta. This is V sine theta, okay? Sorry for that. So to find vertical velocity at any time, you will use this formula and U is the initial velocity that is V sine theta and acceleration is in the downward direction that is minus G. So you are, you are taking upper direction as positive. So acceleration is always in the downward direction. So it is taken as negative, so it is minus G. This is how we find velocity, vertical velocity at any time. It's very important. Vertical component of velocity will become zero at the top. And the total velocity will be obtained by using the vector addition method because you know the horizontal velocity and you know the vertical velocity and they are perpendicular to each other. So this is total velocity that how we obtain this. And variation of speed, speed is maximum initially, it will decrease and it will be zero at the top, sorry, minimum at the top and then it will increase. And if you want to draw the graph of horizontal velocity with time, the horizontal velocity will stay constant. That is, uh, let's say this is Vx. And horizontal acceleration will be zero. That is acceleration time graph. And this is for horizontal velocity. This is for horizontal acceleration. And vertical acceleration will be, vertical velocity will change in this way. This is velocity. And initially vertical velocity is maximum and it will become zero when it is at the top and it will increase. This is the variation of vertical velocity with time t. Okay. And uh, this is top position. And the gradient of this graph will be, will give us the vertical acceleration and vertical acceleration will be the gradient of this graph and that, that is constant. The gradient is negative and it is constant that is equal to minus t. If you draw the 
vertical displacement then it will look like this this is phi n. this is displacement let's say y so gradient of displacement time graph should change in this way this is at the top position the gradient over here is uh, zero so over here vertical velocity is zero so initially the vertical velocity is maximum then vertical velocity decreases at top it becomes zero and then the direction of vertical velocity changes in the opposite direction so gradient becomes negative that is very important equations of displacements of any time so horizontal displacement will be v cos theta into t because horizontal velocity is constant so if velocity is constant displacement is velocity time t so for vertical displacement use this equation s is ut plus half at square so vertical velocity initial vertical velocity time t minus half gt square because this is uh, acceleration will always be in the downward direction and that is minus t okay at point q the vertical displacement becomes zero when object reaches to this point at this point vertical displacement becomes zero so to find uh, time of flight you will put vertical displacement zero in this equation and uh, to find horizontal displacement or at any time you will use this formula time of flight range maximum height are all inversely proportional to gravitational acceleration so on moon the gravitational acceleration is less than than the earth so height and range will be greater than the height and range in the earth then then we start dynamics and uh, product of momentum is defined as product of mass and velocity that is m into v it is a vector quantity so it depends on mass and velocity if the direction of an object changes then the momentum should change for example this object is moving in this direction with velocity v and uh, if it uh, strikes with the surface and comes back with the same speed speed is same but the direction is different so velocity is different if we take uh, to find the change in momentum if we take this direction as positive okay this direction is positive then this is as negative the final momentum is a negative mv this very important and initial momentum is positive mv this over here the velocity is positive so momentum is positive mv and this is negative mv so to find change in momentum we will use this formula final momentum minus initial momentum so that will be 2mv so it will not be change the magnitude will remain same if you change your sign convention if you take right as negative and left as positive then the change in momentum over here will be positive to negative okay so the magnitude will remain same and this negative sign shows that the change in momentum according to your sign convention is towards left direction is very important then comes newton uh, first law a body continues at rest at constant velocity and unless acted upon by a constant or resultant force newton second law is net force is equal to the rate of change of momentum okay so you have to define newton second law using this definition you cannot use this definition f is equal to ma because this is not general definition and that is not acceptable over here this is only valid when the mass of an object is constant but uh, mass on of, of an object can change okay so gradient of momentum time graph is equal to net force you can find using this formula delta p over delta t is gradient so that will be equal to the net force for example this is momentum and this is time and net force at point the gradient at point p is greatest than point a b c d so the net force at point uh, d will be maximum and net force at point p is zero because gradient is parallel to it 
the, the tangent is parallel to the time axis so the gradient will be zero so the net force on this object varies uh, varies at different times so the net force is zero at c it is maximum at b so net force at point a if you calculate net force at point a that the gradient of this point at this point is not zero okay so the area you know that f is delta p over delta t so if i bring this over here that becomes delta p so if you have force time graph then the area of force time graph will be equal to the change in moment this is very important relationship between net force and acceleration that is f is ma a is acceleration a is effect and uh, f is cause okay if there will be net force then there will be acceleration acceleration is directly proportional to net force and acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of object if you apply same net force on two different masses the greater mass will have less acceleration so if you have velocity time graph and uh, how we will find net force net force will be m time acceleration and acceleration is the gradient of velocity time graph so the shape of force time graph will be same because if you will find it will be same as the gradient of this graph so till this point the force is constant uh, sorry acceleration is constant so net force is constant you can see from here so till this point net force is constant after this the gradient uh, gradient is constant to some time but it is greater than the previous value so the force changes to the greater value at uh, without any delay then after this time t you can see from here that the force now gradient decreases to zero so the force should decrease to zero newton third law if an object a applies a force on object b then object b also applies equal and opposite force on object a force on object a and b are called action and reaction pair but you have to define this is the definition of the newton third law and what are the properties of action and reaction they act on two different objects both cannot act at the same object direction is always opposite at at the same time same type of force for example if this is a book that is placed on the table if w is action who applies this force on this book the earth applies so the reaction will be on earth okay if weight of the if w the force on earth applies on the book is in downward direction is an action force then the force on earth in the upward direction will be reaction force over here you can see uh, this is earth this is an object box so weight on the box is due to earth and this force is the reaction of this weight these are action reaction pair okay so w and a are action reaction pair p is the force that box applies on earth as a result the earth applies force on the box in the upward direction so c and b are action reaction force they are contact forces last conservation of momentum total momentum of an isolated system is constant total momentum of an system of interacting body remain constant provided no resultant external force acts on the system for example if these two masses m1 is moving with velocity u1 m2 with u2 and they collide they apply force on each other so after this after collision uh, the velocities of these two objects change the velocity of object a is v1 and velocity of object b is v2 the direction of velocity is same so total momentum before pulling and total momentum of these two system this is m1 u1 plus m2 v2 that will be equal to the total momentum of both objects after this after the collision loss of momentum of one object is equal to the gain of momentum of the other object this law is derived using newton second law and third law these two forces will be equal and opposite in direction that is newton third law so you will use newton third law and second law to reach to this point
So if a collision is in two dimensions, for example, if M1 is moving with velocity v1 and that uh, that collides with M2, that cause it, uh, for example, that uh, that cause having some velocity uh, u2 after collision, M1 moves in this direction with velocity v1 a sorry, and this orbit M2 moves over here with velocity v2 at an angle of theta2. So total momentum in both directions should converge. Along x-axis, momentum of m1 is m1 u1, m2 is m2 u2, sorry, over here is u2. And after this, we will resolve this momentum into two components. This momentum will have one component along x-direction, that is m1 v1 cos theta 1, and this object will, this momentum will also have this x component that is m2 v2 cos theta 2. So, sum of total momentum along x direction before the impact is sum of total momentum along the x direction after the impact. But in vertical direction, total initial momentum is zero. There is no velocity component of both objects in the vertical direction. And after impact, this object have vertical component in the upper direction and this have vertical component in the downward direction. So if you take upward as positive m1 v1 sin theta, then it will be negative m2 v2 sin theta 2. And the total vertical momentum before impact is zero. Elastic collision is over here the total kinetic energy of the system is conserved, total momentum is also conserved. Relative speed of approach is equal to relative speed of separation. If the masses are same, then their speeds are interchanged. It's very important. These two objects are approaching each other. So the relative speeds of approach will be some of these two, and they are moving away from each other. So after impact, so that the speed of separation will be V2 minus V1. In inelastic collision, both momentum and total energy is conserved, but by total kinetic energy is not conserved. If a body at rest explodes into pieces, this will be an example of inelastic collision and the speed of separation, speed of approach will not be equal to speed of separation. If two objects moving separately collide and move as a single object, this will be an example of inelastic collision. Then comes fifth chapter force, density, and pressure. Moment of force is the product of force and perpendicular distance from the pivot, that is F into B. So, unit of moment and the work done will be same, and uh, that is Newton meter, or you can convert into SI wave unit. This is an example. So, on this rod, this is axis of rotation and these two forces are acting tension and weight. So moment of weight will be this force time this perpendicular distance from the pivot to the line of friction of force. That is mg uh, time L by 2. So mg time L by 2 and that is in clockwise direction. Okay. So no, uh, yes, this is in anti-clockwise direction. This is an anti-clockwise direction. And to find the moment of this tension, we will resolve this tension into two components. That is T cos theta and this is T sin theta. T sin theta is passing to pivot. So this has no moment. And T cos theta will have moment T cos theta time L. And that will be in anti-clockwise direction. That will be, sorry, in the clockwise direction. Mostly I can choose in this. So, Net moment is the difference of these two moments. Couple a pair of forces of equal magnitude acting on two objects in opposite direction, which produce rotational motion but not translation motion. Net force on this object will be zero, so this object will not there will be no translation motion and it will rotate in this direction, so it will produce only rotational motion. So these two forces must have some distance between them. Otherwise, they will not be able to produce rotational motion as well. 
so the net force is zero but net moment is not zero so how to find the moment of a couple moment of a couple is the product of one force times distance between the forces this is known as torque this is how we define moment of a couple the product of one force and the shortest distance between the two forces and the moment of couple is independent of uh, moment of couple is independent of pivot sorry this is pivot this is very important if you take pivot over here the moment will be same that will be f into d if you take moment over here anywhere uh, anywhere on the subject for example in this case this is force f f they are they they are forming a moment and the shortest distance between these two forces is this if distance is d then this will be sin theta and the moment the torque over here will be ft sin theta and that that will be in this direction okay so that will be in anti clockwise direction Okay, that will not be in clockwise. That will be in anti-clockwise. Okay, equilibrium. For a static equilibrium, object will be at rest. There will be no rotation, no translation motion. In dynamic equilibrium, object will move with a constant mass. So conditions: there are two important conditions. Resultant force in any direction must be zero. Resultant moment about any point must be zero. So principle of moment states that for an object in rotational equilibrium, sum of clockwise moment about any point, so very important, is equal to sum of anti-clockwise moment about the same point. So there will be uh, in rotational equilibrium net moment about any point must be zero. So if object is in equilibrium under three forces this is a very important case they should form a closed triangle if you add them according to head to tail this is one force other force this is third force so they are making closed triangle so then this means that the first condition of equilibrium will be satisfied and there will be no net force on this object if they pass through a single point they are concurrent then the second condition of equilibrium will also be satisfied there will be no rotational moment so if you extend these three forces they are passing through the same point so they are concurrent if these two conditions are satisfied then the object will be in equilibrium this is very important and density is mass per unit volume so it is a scalar quantity kg per meter cube pressure is force per unit area newton per meter square or pascal pressure due to liquid at some depth is rho gh Force density of liquid g gravitational acceleration in change uh, delta h is change in height. If you go into the liquid by uh, by height delta h, then the pressure will increase by rho g h, and if you move up, then the pressure will decrease. So the pressure in the liquid increases with depth. So total pressure at any point will be pressure due to liquid plus atmospheric pressure. this is an example uh, this uh, on this object four forces are labeled p q r f this is under water so you can see that depth at this point is more than depth at all these points so force pressure at point at this point will be greater than on the pressure at all other points so force r will be greater than p okay then r will be greater than p and s as well so r is greater than all these forces and s and q are equal okay because they are at same level up thrust pressure of the liquid increases with depth which causes an upward force on an object due to liquid this is the cause and of, of an up thrust because the pressure changes with depth so up thrust depends on the density and the liquid uh, density of liquid and the volume of liquid displaced volume of an object displaced is equal to the volume of object inside the liquid so if an object is fully submerged then the volume of liquid displaced is equal to the volume of an object so up thrust is rho gv that is rho is the density uh, 
uh, density of the liquid gives gravitational acceleration with the volume displaced. Okay. Okay. So if uh, so, we can we can say that this is the weight of liquid displaced. Density and volume is there, so this is the weight. This is a scenario where uh, we can see uh, uh, these two objects are fully submerged, P and Q. So they will have same of thrust because the volume is displaced is same. So upward forces is tension plus upward that is equal to the weight. So tension is equal to weight minus of thrust. So tension in these two will be same. But over here in object R, the volume displaced will be smaller, so up thrust is smaller. So if up thrust over here is smaller, so the tension in uh, R will be greater. Okay. So R plus tension plus up thrust is equal to weight. So if up thrust is smaller, then the tension will be greater. Viscous drag is a resistive force when object moves in the fluids, liquids, uh, air. It is due to the resistance between the surface of object and liquid. It acts in the opposite direction of motion. That is very important. It depends on the relative speed of object and liquid. If you increase the speed, it will increase. For example, this uh, this object is uh, on this object. Uh, this object is moving down. So up thrust will always be in the upper direction. Drag force over here is in the upper direction. That is opposite in the direction of motion. So if it is moving in the constant speed, then the total net force on this object will be zero. So upward forces. If drag plus up thrust will be equal to the weight of object. This was an example. Then comes work energy and power. Work is the product of force and the displacement in the direction of force. So work is F into D. If force makes an angle theta with displacement, then what we will do, we will resolve this force that is F cos theta. And displacement in direction is D. So work done will be F cos theta into D. If theta is 90 degree, work done by that force is zero. Work done by our own gases is P delta V, where P is pressure and delta V is change in volume. Work done by gas if volume increases. If the gas expands, the work is done by the gases. If the gas compre is compressed, then the work is done on the gas. Energy of body due to its speed is kinetic energy, and that is a half mv square. Work energy principle states that the work done by net force is equal to the change in kinetic energy. This is very important. If on this object two forces are uh, acting F and FR, and the net force is F minus FR, work done by a net force is FD minus FR is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Initial speed was U, final speed was V. So this is very important. Elastic potential energy energy stored in an object due to force force changing its shape. So gravitational potential energy is the energy of mass that is due to the position in gravitational field that is mgh. For example, uh, if an object is taken from point B to point R, this is surface of Earth. So the the distance that the vertical distance that this object covers is 30. So to find change in potential energy, we will use this 30 that is mg 30. The potential energy will take, will increase. Over here we are taking as potential energy as zero. So potential energy at this point will be mg 30. This is again very important situation. If if this object, for example, falls. So this is final position, this is initial position. To find the change in gravitational potential energy, you will find the distance between its center of mass. Okay, center of mass is the geometrical center of the regular shape object. So you will find this distance that will be used to find the change in gravitational potential energy. Power is the rate of doing work or the rate of energy transferred. Power is work done over time. So unit is watt or joule per second. Gradient of energy time graph is power. Other formula of power is Fv, that is F is driving force, V is velocity. Law of conservation of energy. If there is no external force, non-conservative force, then the total energy of the object remains constant. 
gravitational force is conservative force so if an object moves under the grav only gravitational force then the total mechanical energy will be constant friction force is an example of non conservative force if an object is thrown up the gravitation field there is no external net force then the gravitation potential energy will increase and kinetic energy will decrease loss of kinetic energy will be equal to the gain in potential energy. efficiency is the ratio of useful power output to the power input so power output over power input the energy output over energy input so to find the efficiency in percentage we multiply it and then comes deformation of solids deformation is the change in shape and size of object deformation is caused by the tensile or compressive force in elastic deformation if the force is removed object goes back to original position in plastic deformation is permanent deformation if the, you you remove the force in the object there is uh, there is some permanent deformation permanent change in the shape of an object this is known as uh, permanent length works law the extension is proportional to applied force if the limit of proportionality is not exceeded f is applied force x is extension so f is kx where k is the spring constant Whose unit is newton per meter. So, if you draw f and x graph, then up to the limit of proportionality, if it will be straight line, and gradient will be uh, gradient will be spring constant. If you draw force length graph of, for example, spring, it had original length l naught, and its length will increase uh, linearly, and the gradient of this graph will also be spring constant. If you cross limit of proportionality after this, the graph will look like this. So A is the limit of proportionality up to this. The Hooke's law is over. Elastic limit is the point after which there is a permanent deformation. So over here in this graph, this is S is limit of proportionality. T uh, after T, if you start unloading this object, this doesn't. Regain its original shape. There is some permanent extension. So limit, elastic limit lies somewhere between T and S. Combination of springs. If you have these springs connected in this way, they are in series. So the effective spring constant will be obtained by using this formula: one over K one, one over K two plus one over K two. If the springs are in parallel, so in this case, extension in each spring is different. Because the spring constant are different, but the total extension is the sum of individual extension. In parallel extension in each spring is same. Tension in each spring will be different because the spring constant are different. So effective spring constant is the sum of all individual spring constant. To find equivalent capacitance in this case, these three springs are connected in parallel, and their results will be connected in series with the spring. So first find their result, and then use that result with the other. Stress is force per unit area. Unit is Pascal. Strain is ratio of change in length to the original length that has no unit. So Young modulus is the ratio of stress over strain. So if you put F over A, E over L, then you will get this one. So if you make E as a subject, then extension is proportional to original length. If all other things are same, extension is proportional to applied force. If you keep all other things same. Extension is inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. Extension is proportional inversely proportional to Young modulus. The graph of stress strain will be a straight line up till a point where Hooke's law is obeyed. So the gradient of this graph is Young modulus, and after this point, this will look like this. Strain energy are work done. The force extension. If you have force extension graph, area under force extension graph is equal to the work done in deforming an object. Till point X, you will use it is a straight line, and you area is area of triangle. So half F into X, half K X. Where if you put F is K X. Area under stress strain graph will be equal to energy stored per unit volume. If you have stress strain graph. Then uh, the unit of area will be energy over volume. Then comes wave. Wave is a source of transferring energy. Types of waves on medium deployment. 
there are mechanical waves which do not uh, which require medium for example uh, sound waves water waves electromagnetic waves they do not require medium electric and magnetic fields vibrate perpendicularly types of waves on the direction of vibration there are two types longitudinal waves uh, particle direction of particle vibration is parallel in the direction of energy travel transverse waves the sound waves are example of longitudinal waves and transverse waves particle vibrate in per perpendicular direction to the direction of energy of waves so water waves is an example types of wave on energy transfer progressive waves transfer energy stationary waves do not transfer energy between uh, two points the energy is spread between two points displacement is the distance of point and wave from this position amplitude is the maximum displacement time period is the uh, time taken for vibrating point on a wave for a complete cycle number of oscillation frequencies number of oscillation per unit time and that is 1 by t unit is hertz or second unit. wavelength is the distance moved by wave energy or wave front during one cycle of the source minimum distance between two points with the same phase minimum distance between existing pairs and cross wave equation is v is f lambda where v is speed wavelength okay so graphs of uh, waves displacement distance graph if you have on vertical axis you have displacement on horizontal axis distance then this is wavelength and this is amplitude this shows the displacement of all points at a particular time you can see this point is at mean position this is at upper extreme this is lower extreme this, these are at mean this is upper extreme so displacement time graph it shows the position of one particular one particle at different time on vertical axis you have displacement over here time so this will be time period this will be amplitude so from here you can find time period and amplitude and you can use formula of frequency to calculate frequency phase difference between two points on a on one wavelength apart is 360 degree or two phase okay so if if you have displacement distance graph and the points are at distance x from each other then the phase difference will be calculated x over wavelength into 360 degree particles having phase difference of 180 degree are known as anti phase and 0 or 360 are called in phase for example phase difference of two waves if you want to calculate what will you do these are two waves and this is displacement oh. distance graph you will uh, notice the distance between same phase points and then you will use x over lambda to 360 the both waves should have same wavelength and if it is displacement distance graph then you will note time between two same phase points okay so then divided by time period into 360 these two waves are in phase because crest of one wave overlaps with the crest of other wave and top of other wave overlaps to the top of first wave intensity of wave is if the crest overlaps with the crest then they are anti phase for example if one wave is this and other wave is this this they are out of phase by 180 degree or anti phase intensity of wave is power per unit area or energy per unit area per unit time so unit is watt per meter square intensity depends intensity is proportion to frequency square intensity is proportion to amplitude square if you increase amplitude by a factor of 2 intensity will increase by a factor of 4 so if you have a constant source that is source is producing a constant power then the intensity at distance r is inversely proportional to r square if you move away from r uh, the intensity will decrease and as you know intensity is proportional to amplitude square this is again very important so amplitude of vibration of particle will be inversely proportional to r this is electromagnetic waves spectrum electromagnetic waves are those waves which have same speed speed of light in vacuum they do not require medium electric and magnetic fields vibrate 
perpendicular to each other. This is our frequency and wavelength change. You can see, you, you just notice from here that steady waves uh, have the least uh, frequency. As you move here, the frequency increases and the wavelength decreases. Okay, you just, you should know, you should memorize these things. Doppler effect, the phenomena in which the observed frequency is different from the source frequency uh, due to the relative motion of source and observer. If F naught is frequency, uh, observed frequency, F is the frequency of source, V is the velocity of source, V is the velocity of this. If the source is moving towards the stationary observer, frequency will increase, wavelength will decrease, and observed frequency will be obtained by this formula. If the source is moving away from the observer, we will consider the observer at rest. Then frequency will decrease. Okay. And the wavelength will increase. If the source is moving at constant velocity, then the shift in frequency is constant. Mean to say, if the source is coming from this point and observer is at this point, then the change in frequency will uh, have the constant shift. There will be no effect uh, by the source, distance of the source uh, from this observer. There will be constant shift. And that constant shift is obtained from the above formula. In case of light source, we consider the change in wavelength. If the source moves away, then the wavelength will increase. Obviously, frequency will decrease. This is known as redshift. If the source moves towards the observer, the wavelength will decrease. This is known as leakage. Superposition of waves, when waves overlap, then they, uh, then they interfere. Principle of superposition, when waves meet, resultant displacement is the sum of individual displacements. Very important. Coherent waves, waves in which have the constant phase difference between them, constant phase relationship between them. Phase difference should not change with time. We can observe interference only when the waves are coherent. So conditions for consecutive and destructive interference, if these are two sources and the waves from these two sources come and meet at this point T, they have some different distance covered. So if the sources uh, are producing coherent waves, then uh, at point P, the path difference are uh, the path lengths are different. So phase difference for constructive interference, phase difference should be zero or two sixty or two pi. So path difference should be integer multiple of wave one wavelength if the if the sources are in phase, where n can be zero, one, two, three, two. If each source is produced wave with amplitude a the intensity uh, I, then at point P, the amplitude will be 2A, amplitude will double and intensity will become four times. For destructive interference, path difference should be N plus half lambda, that is uh, integer multiple of lambda by two. If the sources are out of phase, then the condition becomes opposite. These conditions will change, will will switch it uh, if the sources have already phase difference of 180 degrees. Then this will be the condition of destructive interference and this will become the condition of constructive interference. This is very important. The friction, the spreading of waves into geometrical shadow when it passes through an aperture or edge is known as the friction. This is spreading, okay? More diffraction over here, less diffraction. Diffraction depends on the comparison between the gap width and the wavelength. If they are approximately equal, if the gap width is approximately equal or smaller than the wavelength, then there will be more diffraction. Always diffract. In B, there is less diffraction. In A, there is more diffraction. Wavelength and speed do not change, but uh, but the amplitude will change because. Uh, the distance from the source has increased. Amplitude at this point will be more than the amplitude at this point. Okay. But the frequency, uh, wavelength, 
they will be sent. This is double slit interference, and over here we are dealing with the interference of the light, light from these two, light from single source uh, comes, and at this point we have two openings. So single slit is used to get the coherent light. So light from these two sources meet at the screen. So at some point, you can see this is the max, at these points, this is the maximum, uh, uh, the points at which you will, you will see the, always see the constructor interference. And then you can see at this line, you will see a destructive interference. The crest of one wave overlap with the top of other wave. Then again, uh, constructive interference, destructive interference. So on this whole length, this whole line, you will have constructive interference. So at central point, you will see a maximum point, then destructive interference, then constructive, and distance between two, two constructive interference uh, uh, points is known as uh, uh, the, this distance is a uh, uh, fringe separation and the fringe separation depends on this formula. So dark fringes are obtained where the sector interference is there and bright fringes where the sector interference is there. Distance between two cons cons conductive bright or dark fringes is called fringe separation and it is it is denoted by x and x depends on wavelength d wavelength and distance d of screen from the slits this is distance d and uh, this is the distance between two slits that is that is a over here x is directly proportional to wavelength and mercy proportional to this and directly proportional Fringe spacing will increase. How you can increase this x? You can increase this x by increasing wavelength or by decreasing frequency. If you decrease frequency, the wavelength will increase. By increasing distance d, because it is proportional to d of the screen, or by decreasing slit separation, because it is inversely proportional. There will be no effect on the fringe separation by changing the width of each slit. If you will increase this width, there will be no change on the fringe separation. X will remain the same. Diffraction grating. Diffraction grating consists on many slits. This is diffraction grating. Light pass from these slits and in, interfere constructive and destructively, which results in dark and bright fringes on the screen. So this is diffraction grating, monochromatic light pass through. This is zero order maximum, then second order maximum. At these points, the light interferes constructively. So over here, the equation for this is d sine theta is n lambda, where d is uh, d is the distance between two lines or splits of the grating, and d is one over n. N is the number of lines per unit length. So diffraction grating comes with this property. Uh, n is given, so you will find d that is the distance between the two lines. This is the distance between two lines. And D is inversely proportional to N. And this N is order of nth bright fringes. And the theta is angle of n bright fringes from the central fringes. For example, this is theta of first, first order, first bright fringe with this. This is theta of second order bright fringe with central, and this is theta of third. For maximum number of order of maxima, you should put sine theta as one because the maximum value of sine theta is one. Then you will get d is n lambda and n will be d over n. Okay. So for example, if you get n as 3.8, you will round it at to the lower bound. That is three. This is very important. You don't have to round it, round it by using the mathematical principle. So the total number of maxima will be seven, three up. This is central. If you get 
n c one two three c will be up and c will be down from the central so total six plus this one seven so total will be seven very important stationary waves there is no net transfer of energy in stationary waves stationary waves are formed by two progressive waves having same amplitude frequency amplitude and moving in opposite direction very important in stationary wave all particles do not vibrate with the same amplitude very important some particles vibrate with the greatest amplitude called anti node some particles do not vibrate called node distance between two conductive nodes or anti nodes is equal to half wavelength okay you can see this is stationary wave these kinds of nodes 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 so distance between two convective nodes or anti nodes will be half wavelength and this distance will be equal to one wavelength all particles between two nodes are in phase these particles are in phase and these particles are out of phase from these particles by 180 degrees so in stationary wave you have only two phase differences zero or 180 all points between two convective nodes Are in phase. Points between two convective nodes and next convective nodes have phase difference of 180 degree. Okay, so phase difference between R and Q is 180 degree, and phase difference between S and Q is zero. So very important. Stationary waves in string nodes are formed at both ends. Nodes, nodes. Okay, so fundamental first harmonic will be like this. Single loop will be formed. So fundamental frequency will be v by two l, and if you f is v by two l, and wavelength will be equal to two l. Because this is all one wavelength. The distance between two nodes. Will be half wavelength. Okay, so length of string is equal to half wavelength. This is length of string. So lambda is two times l. And for second harmonic, you should also know, always know that the nodes are formed at the at both ends. So the second harmonic will be formed like this. So over here, the frequency of second harmonic is two times f one. Now the le length becomes equal to one wave length because this is one wave length. This is one wave length in this case. In this case, in third harmonic, the second overtone, you will see this type of stationary wave. Nodes, nodes. And uh, both nodes are formed at end, and in this case, the frequency will be three times f one. So this is general formula n f one, where n is zero, one, two, three. Stationary waves at closed pipe. If a, if a pipe is closed at one end and open at the other end, and uh, stationary waves will be formed by the And the waves, for example, if you put a source over here on one side, and uh, the sound from this source, this is vibrating source, will travel and they will come back, reflect from this surface, and the stationary waves will be formed. So far at this point, and open end anti node will be formed at at the closed end node will be formed. So for fundamental frequency, you can see that this is lambda by four. Okay, so this length is equal to lambda by four. So lambda is equal to four l, and frequency is v by lambda. So this is v by four l. This is fundamental frequency. Then. Uh, no anti nodes over here. Nodes are over here. This will be. This will be third harmonic. So if you calculate its frequency, the wavelength over the length is three lambda by four. 
this is you can see this is lambda by 2 and this is lambda by 4 so it is 3 lambda by 4 so frequency over here c times f1 and the wavelength decreases by a factor of c okay so it becomes c lambda by 4 initial wavelength was uh, 4 lambda and if you calculate over here the wavelength will be uh, original wavelength divided by fundamental wavelength divided by c so only odd harmonics exist so frequency of nth harmonic will be nf1 wave 1 3 5 7 only especially ways in open wire anti nodes will be formed at both ends so for fundamental frequency you will draw you should be able to draw the wave l is lambda by 4 because for lambda by 2 the whole length is lambda by 2 This is distance between. This is anti node. This is anti node. This is anti node. So this is lambda by two. Over here, this is lambda. This is three lambda by two. You can check it. So fundamental first harmonic is v by two l. If you calculate using this, lambda is two l. Second harmonic is two times f one. You can verify. You should. This is quick summary lecture, so I am not going to draw it. So nth harmonic will be nf1. So wavelength will decrease, frequency will increase. Electric field have excluded from the course. Now let's do this. Electric current. Electric current is the rate of rate of flow of electric charge. So that is the unit is. Uh, Unit is ampere, and that is uh, coulomb. Uh, ampere is SI. Electric current is base quantity, and ampere is SI base unit. So equation of current is in a q v, where n is the number density. It's very important number of free electrons per unit volume. A is cross sectional area of material. V is the mean drift velocity of the charged particle in q v. If you make v subject. The drift velocity will become uh, I over n a q. If current increases, drift velocity will increase. If the wire is wire is thinner, drift velocity is inversely proportional to the cross section area. Okay, so the electrons move more quickly from a given current. Drift velocity is inversely proportional to cross section area. In a material with lower density of electron, drift velocity is more because it is inversely proportional to n. So let's do this example over here. The current is same at this region, wire P and wire Q. The di the diameters are different, so the drift velocity will be different. As the drift velocity is inversely proportional to area, so it is inversely proportional to diameter squared. Okay, so you can write this equation that V time area is constant. Our V one time A one is equal to V two time. Okay, so diameter is twice. So the drift velocity will be one fourth of drift velocity over here. So drift velocity at P is four times drift velocity at Q. Potential difference. Across a component is the energy transferred per unit charge. Energy converted from electrical to other forms per unit charge, joule per coulomb. EMF, electromotive force, is the energy transferred per unit charge driving a charge around a complete circuit. Energy or per charge, both are same units. Okay. In one, the energy is converted from electrical to other forms, and in other, the energy is converted from other forms to electrical. Power is V I I square R V square over R. Electric resistance is the ratio of potential difference to the current that is V over R. Ohm's law: potential difference across a component is proportional to current flowing through it, provided its physical conditions are not changed. So V is I time R. Ohm's law is obeyed by metallic conductor at constant temperature. 
if a component obeys ohm law then the iv graph will be straight line and over here you know that v is ir if uh, v is on y axis i is on x axis then the gradient is r but if i is on y axis v is on x axis then the gradient is 1 over r what it diode and filament lamp do not follow on the as the resistance are not constant the resistance of filament lamp increases with increase in current okay so this is current time uh, voltage graph so resistance over here is 1 over gradient gradient is decreasing so resistance is increasing so resistance of filament lamp increases with uh current so the i time graph iv graph will look like this resistance of diode will if if you have v time graph so the v in on y axis and i on x axis then the graph will look like this resistance of diode decreases with increase in current so this is iv graph for diode resistance is related with length in cross section area so resistance is directly proportional to l and inversely proportional to a so resistance is rho l over r rho is the resistivity unit of rho is ohm meter you can make from here its resistance of unit length of wire having 1 meter cross section area resistance of light dependent resistor decreases as the light intensity increases resistance of thermistor decreases as the temperature increases it will be assumed that thermistors have negative temperature okay even the thermistors are available whose resistance will increase with temperature but in our course we will use this one kirch of first law the sum of currents entering at any point in a circuit is equal to the sum of currents leaving the same point this law is law of conservation of charge kirch of second law the sum of emf around any loop is a circuit is equal to the sum of potential difference so delta uh, e is equal to delta v and this is the law of conservation of energy combined resistance if the resistors are in series combined resistance the sum of individual resistances if they are in parallel in 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 series the current through each resistor will be same potential difference will be different if the resistors are different in parallel potential difference across each is same current will be different if the resistors are different and we, we will use this formula to find the uh, combined resistance and overall resistance will decrease in case of two resistors the combined resistance in parallel combined resistance will be used by this formula product over internal resistance if this is a source and this is internal resistance uh, then the potential difference across this resistor is known as terminal potential difference and that is e emf minus the potential difference drop across this resistor it's very important if we plot v time i graph it will be a straight line with negative gradient that is minus r so you will see you will have this type of graph the gradient will be equal to minus r the power across r is maximum when this r is equal to internal resistance very important potential divider if we connect two resistors in series then we the potential difference across this r1 will be obtained by this formula we can get some proportion of this uh, potential difference so that divides the we can divide the potential difference. okay so if you uh, in this case this is light dependent resistor and uh, if you this is very important very important if you increase this r1 then this potential difference will increase potential difference across both resistor will be the ratio of potential difference across both resistor will be equal to the ratio of potential difference of both resistors and if you decrease this r resistor r2 the potential difference across r1 will also 
okay or vice versa so this is the formula r1 over sum of total resistance into v0 ratio of voltage across both resistors is equal to the ratio of the resistance this is light dependent resistance this resistor so output voltage if light intensity is increased this resistance will decrease resistance over here will decrease if you increase the light intensity then this output voltage will increase in in this circuit both resistors are equal in value so this is x and this is y sorry this is p and q and uh, this terminal is varied from y to x okay or x to y over here it is varied in x to y in the potential difference v at x it is maximum as you move it down the, the resistance between this point and this point will decrease so the potential difference will decrease at this point uh, it will be equal to the potential difference across this resistance of potential difference will decrease it will reach to the non zero value because we are not moving this point below the zero then the last chapter is nuclear physics in this electricity uh, this is one thing potential meter as well is included in our course and in potential potential meter is used to measure the compare the emfs of the two batteries and uh, the circuit of potential meter is like this this is a wire of length let's say L. and if you connect a source uh, this this is e1 this is e2 and this is galvanometer we will move this point from point a till b okay so we will see the deflection of this, this galvanometer at this point let's say there is no deflection this is l1 then this uh, emf of this source will be that is you know that potential uh, difference resistance of a wire is rho l over a okay so potential difference across this l1 will be equal to uh, l1 divided by the total length l this is potential difference between point a and c times c1 this is the total potential difference you can you can check that the resistance of ac is rho l1 over a and total resistance ab this is also a potential divider rho l over a they will cancel out times c1 so if if there is no deflection in the galvanometer then the emf of this source becomes the potential difference across this ac so that is e is l1 over l times e1 nuclear physics protons and neutrons are present in the nucleus very obvious protons have positive charge equal to e there is elementary charge electrons orbit around the nucleus charge in electron is equal to minus e neutron has no charge total number of protons and neutrons are called nucleon number general representation x is ab where a is proton number and b is nucleon number upper number is nucleon number alpha scattering experiment In this experiment, alpha particles were bombarded on the metal foil of gold. This is uh, this is gold foil, and these are alpha particles. So after bombardment, majority of alpha particles pass through this gold foil without any deflection or deviated with very small deflection, small angles, less than ten degrees. If alpha particles deviated at large angle greater than ninety degrees, you can see from here this this. So Conclusion: Most of the atom is empty space. Conclusion from this point is: If they pass undeviated or with very less uh, deviation, most of the atom is empty space. Size of nucleus is very small as compared to the atom. Nucleus contain majority of majority mass of an atom. Okay. If there is very small deflection, then the nucleus uh, contains 
most of the part of the uh, atom is empty state and nucleus contain majority of atom and the charge charge on the nucleus is positive this is very important this is this is again another conclusion so before this experiment it was part that the mass of an atom is spread uniformly throughout the volume of an atom this experiment concluded that the size of the nucleus which contains nearly whole all the mass okay radiations are alpha they are helium nuclei charge is 4e because there are uh, two uh, two proton wait a second you can see that okay so there is there is some mistake charge is equal to 2e so i is the charge of electron okay because the proton number is 2 and neutron number is 4 okay so the reaction this is very example for example if you have this ar2141 and it emits uh, alpha particle then uh, this number will be decreased by 2 that is uh, 21 minus 2 19 and this upper number is decreased by 4 proton number is reduced by 2 and nucleon number is reduced by 4 so approximate mass of alpha particle is this beta radiation beta negative it is negatively charged charge is equal to the charge of an electron this is an example ar this is beta negative negative lower minus 1 and 0 so this number will increase charge number of any uh, equation should conserve and nucleon number should also conserve so there will be no change in the upper proton number is increased by 1 and no change in nucleon number neutron is uh, neutron is converted to proton in this uh, in this case so neutron is converted to proton and uh, this is anti neutrino and uh, this is beta negative beta positive charge is positive e reaction example this is beta positive lower number will be decreased by 1 and this number will be same gamma radiation electromagnetic radiation no charge uh, so not affected by both magnetic and electric field we have greater greater penetration power this is an example of alpha very less penetration it is they are stored from the paper beta passes to paper and they stored by 1 mm aluminum and gamma pass to all the lead ion fundamental particles there are two main groups of particles leptons and hadrons strong interaction doesn't act between leptons or leptons are fundamental particles electron neutrino and neutrino hadron strong interaction acts between the hadron they are not fundamental particles they are made up of quarks proton neutron are example quarks of 2 by 3 down the minus 1 by 3 tends minus 1 by 3 down 2 by 3 Each charge has an anti-particle with opposite charge, but the same. For example, anti up is represented by this, and charge will be minus zero. Proton is made up of two up quarks and one down quark because two up is uh, up quark is you can see two by three. E. So two by three e plus two by three e. Minus one by three, so that is uh, the charge will be e. And neutron is made by one up and two down. In beta negative decay, neutron changes to proton. Anti neutrino is produced. This is an equation. Down quark is changes to up quark because n n n is formed by u d d. and if it is proton is formed that is u u d so you can see that 
a down torque changes to up torque this sound remains same for example this up sign and one down torque changes to up torque before there were two down torques now there are two ups and one down so down torque changes to up torque this is again very important in beta positive decay proton changes to neutron okay neutrino is emitted and uh, up torque changes to down you can see up up down to up down down so up torque changes to down weak nuclear force gives rise to this decay quantity is that is conserved in any reaction mass energy is conserved okay so if mass increases energy decreases so the combined mass and energy should should be conserved only mass and energy are not conserved proton number is conserved nucleon number is conserved charge is conserved momentum is conserved so this is uh, all about ace physics hope you uh, it was helpful for you if you enjoyed and it was helpful for you and please uh, share it to your friends thank you so much